Okay. All right. Here we go. Uh, it is Monday, Monday, Monday. We are back to the Back to the Sal study course. Welcome, everyone. We got our crowd assembled, as it were. Um, we got uh, BD and Andrew and Kel joining us this evening. Um, as well as some others. So well, welcome, welcome. Um, I was late with the uploading the video from last week. Uh, it's uploaded this morning, so that is up, and this will be. I'll try to upload this before I go to bed tonight. And uh, yeah, so um, here we go. Um, back to the South Study Course. The purpose of this course again is to um, take a walk through the Getty and to point out a lot of things that we sometimes miss uh, when we're on the floor or we don't have time to talk about. Um, because there is a lot of distance between the manuscript and what we train on the cell floor. So um, the first uh, project, I guess, in this Back to the Cell Study course is going to be to walk through the Getty, and then um, afterwards we'll, uh, we'll move on to something else. As a taster, I was actually uh, thinking that it might be worthwhile going through Vadi after we do Fiore. As I know, Vadi is pretty new for me. I think that would be pretty exciting to walk through it together, and it would be very much in line with what we, what we will have been used to looking through the Getty. So I haven't made a firm decision on that yet, but uh, I'm kind of throwing that out there. Uh, maybe if uh, maybe people end up giving me some feedback about that, I, I make a decision. But yeah, uh, yeah. So um, as as I say every week in this course. Um, it's pr principally me who is taking you through it. Um, my opinion is just one of many. And like um, all the uh, free scholars and provost at Emma, I'm sure we want you to be convinced by the same evidence that we're convinced by. We don't just want you to think something just because we said it. All right. So without further ado, let's get into the uh, subject for this week. So last week we well let's let's pull back a little bit first. We're doing the sword and two hands section right now. We're going to be in this for a, a number of weeks. Um, so broadly speaking, uh, like I said last week, I've conceived this section as comprising uh, one, two, uh, three, four, five, six parts, I guess. Um, one collection of guards, then the cuts, then a little preface commentary. Then uh, Joko Largo, Joko Stretto, and then the final uh, master. So we're um, we're in the guards. We're starting with the guards. Now, last week um, we dealt with this very important piece of text here, 22 R, A, and B. We spent quite a bit of time on that. Went through every sentence. Uh, I made a bit of a big deal about this uh, particular piece of text, and I think rightly so. And then we looked at the six guards, each dissimilar from one another uh, afterwards. Um, and the naming conventions I've uh, given here for the wiki, um, it's my own naming conventions, um, but it's according to my perception of how similar the guard is to the armored, the guards in the armored section, sword and armor section. So um, we have Posta Sagittaria, Coda Lunga, um, Posta Breve, uh, uh, Serpentina, uh, Posta de Croce Bastarda, Posta di Donna, and then, and then this guy. Uh, we, um, we looked at each of these posters last week. We saw lots of interesting stuff. And we finished off with a really interesting little conversation about this guy here and about the sword he, uh, the, this guy is carrying which um, I suggested may in fact be uh, the sword, at least one of the swords that Fiore shows at the end of the sword and armor section. Uh, guy. Mike on. This guy right here. So yeah, that was really neat. That was really cool. And now we're on to the, um, the postus, as it were, the, the 12. The 12 postus, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So the this, the next set of twelve posters. Um, we'll see how far we get through this today. Um, what characterizes um, or makes these twelve different from the previous six is principally well, not not only because in Post Sagittaria he he says we are six 
guards each dissimilar from one another. So he's he kind of separates it verbally from the from the following twelve. But the post is going to look at today, they have a piece of red text on them, which is going to be very interesting uh, for, for us, um, along with some description. The red text description was not given for these, the, these first six. Why? I don't know. There may be th theories f floating around about, uh, about that. Um, but yeah. So does anybody have any questions um, from last week? before we start this week? No? Okay. Oh, yes. And about questions, as always, uh, if you do have questions, please do. Uh, please bring them up. Please ask um, all the questions you have. Uh, questions are good. Chances are, if you have a question, everybody else has the same question. Okay? All right. So, Folio 23V... A. I'm just going to drag Discord off to the side so I can uh, see the folks without having to bring it up all the time. All right. 26 VA, Porte di Ferro Pulsativa. Can we have Alex read the text for us? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Here being the guards of the sword in two hands, which are 12. The first one is to the Porta di Ferro, very strong and good for waiting against any handheld weapon, long or short, provided that your sword is a good quality and not too long. The guard parries, passes, and comes to the close. She can exchange thrusts and deliver her own. She can also beat thrusts to the ground, always proceeding with a pass and parrying any kind of attack. She can defend without much effort against anyone who picks a fight with her. Okay, wow. Um... I love this text of the post. It's it's, um, it's 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 so descriptive. All right. So complete complete iron door, full iron door. Um. All right. So a word to begin. Well, so here again, just like he did with uh, post Sagittaria, he uh, verbally differentiates the next twelve guards from the previous six. Though it's not clear what criteria he's he's differentiating them by. But here we go. Here begin the twelve guards of the two-handed sword. The first is Tuta Porta di Ferro, and it's good for waiting against any handheld weapon, long or short, provided that your sword is, is of good quality and not too long. So um, I'm, I'm glad we're starting with this one, because I want to take this opportunity to correct something which I think I said a little too quickly last week. So when we talked about the posters, I said something to the effect of, uh, that postas were guards that you can lie in that provide good opportunities for defense and offense. And I was thinking about that a bit over the last week, and I realized that that's really not a very good definition, or at least it leaves out something important. And that is that this whole time we've been talking about uh, postas and fury, right? The sword posters are not uh, the you know, are not new. Right? We're not new to the concept of posta. And I've said every section so far we've come across i've said if i had to distill fiore down to one sentence i would say it's just a series of post transitions all of his responses all of his attacks all of his moves just a series of post transitions and so i was thinking about that with respect to the sword posters and i didn't want to give the impression that i thought sword posters were somehow more static than the wrestling or dagger posters because of course you're not only going to use the sword posters to lie in but you're also going to uh, use them to move through and to move to from posta through posta to posta so they're not so uh, while they are positions that you can often lie in to give you great advantage they're by no means stationary or like they're by no means um uh, defensive in nature, if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, and why am I bringing this up now? Well, it's good to remember because this post to here, Fiore says specifically is a good one and very strong for waiting it against any handheld weapon, long or short. That's quite the, that's quite the, uh, the, uh, the category, right? Any handheld weapon, long or short, Provided your sword is of good quality and not too long. Um, 
this makes sense, although this, provided that your sword is of good quality, I mean, <sighs> if it was in bad quality, are there better posts to lie in? You know, I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly what he means by that, but sure, if you have a good sword, okay, good, and not too long. This, I'm not really sure what he means. Uh, I don't know, Kel, if you have a theory as to what, what this might mean, but I've never really understood this proviso of his. That's not too long. If you have a very long blade, if you have a very long yeah. blade, it's difficult to bring it up to the center as quickly as you need because the tip will lag. You have to move it more quickly. Like a bigger wheel has longer spokes, yes, but it also, okay. the, the outside the wheel mm -hmm. goes around more slowly. Mm -hmm. So in this case, if you want mm -hmm. a sword that isn't so long that it can't intercept something mm -hmm. on the blade, and preferably on the the mm -hmm. middle of the blade at least so if you have a very long long sword like those big great big spadoni things yeah uh, it's pretty hard to use from this position and in fact in those manuscripts there is no there's no guard like this so so would that would that logically would, would it logically follow then that he would say point forward guards are better for swords that are long uh, uh that are longer because the point's already forward no not, it's just, it's just is different that, entirely. You, you end up mixing, yeah. You end okay. up mixing different traditions together. Okay. All right. I was uh, just, I mean, uh, just, you, just curious. Mm -hmm. When you look at body, bodies, mm -hmm. eighty-five years later, mm -hmm. all of his swords are much longer, mm -hmm. and uh, they're almost always point forward or in some sort of tail. Or okay. Like yeah. that. Interesting. Um, and uh, like for example, post de Falcon mm -hmm. and uh, in body mm -hmm. is is sort of a primed fendente position. Right. Right, uh, but it, it's it's also it's also a really sucked out place to receive a satano. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, Liam Neeson certainly found that out in the uh, Kingdom of Heaven, didn't he? Um, <laughs> uh, or was oh, that an God. was that an arrow? Anyways, I don't want to. Sorry, I don't want to get. Us, I shouldn't have mentioned it. I shouldn't have mentioned it. It's too much rage. I I triggered myself. All right. <laughs> Uh, moving on. Um, so provided that your sword is of good quality, not too long. Okay, great. From this guard. You parry and pass and come to the close. Okay. Again, something something very interesting, right? Um, it can exchange thrusts and deliver its own. Okay, so these two pieces of text are important for me. Because if we just read this, we might think that Fiore is saying, when you're in Full Iron Gate, you should parry and pass and come to the close. Right. If we just read this piece of text here, but then right after that, he says it can exchange thrust and deliver its own. An exchange of thrust is a classic Largo action. Also beating thrust to the ground, always proceeding with a pass and a parrying any kind of attack. That also sounds like a classic, uh, some kind of classic uh, Jekyll Largo actions. We haven't seen these yet, but but flag that in your mind. Right. Um. And it can defend without much effort against anyone picking a fight with it. So I read this as basically saying you can do pretty much everything from this guy, right? Um, you can parry, you can pass, you can come to the close, you can exchange thrusts, you can beat, a, you can beat thrust down, um, parrying and um, proceeding with a pass. Always proceeding with a pass and parrying any kind of attack. It implies you're going to give another attack of your own in response from the parry. So this is, sounds like a pretty... Sounds like he's saying some pretty positive things about this guard. All right. Uh, quick question. How, yeah. like, how would you uh, beat it down? You have to bring the sword up and then bring it down. Or do you mean beat it like this, to the side? Well, okay. So, yes. Um, that's a good question because... In this post section, Fiore is going to talk a lot about plays. And you know what? We should we should treat I was thinking that we try and save some big concepts for the for the Largo section and the Strato section, but I want to take the plays in the post seriously. So we might have to just talk about this stuff uh, right away as opposed to saving it uh, uh, saving it for later. So, um, can you ask your question again, Alex, just so everybody can hear it, and then uh, and then I'll, I'll answer. Yeah. Uh, 
do you beat the sword down or do you beat it to the side from this position? Right. Okay. When, so yeah, and you uh, also and you also asked, uh, what does it mean? He says beat the sword down, but you're in a low guard. So how yeah, do we understand yeah. exactly? So how do we understand beating swords to, to the ground when you're in a low guard? Okay. So in order to answer that question, we have to talk about an, the exchange of point. What's called an exchange of point. But in order to answer that question, mm. we're going to have to talk about what, why an exchange of point is is different from dealing with with cuts. So um, I'm going to try and thread the needle here. I'm going to try and talk about defenses against cuts and defenses against thrust in Jaco Largo very briefly and save some room for to, to discuss it uh, when we actually get to the Largo section. But I do think it's, we're going to have to add some context. OK, so. The difference between defend, well, first of all, Largo, right? I, I, a Largo and Stretto, let's start there. Let's start there. I told you we'd, we'd have to get to it at some point, and it looks like uh, we've arrived. So in the sword section, <laughs> we have, again, the guards, the cuts, some prefissary comments, Largo, Stretto, and then the last master. The bulk of the plays are in these two sections here, Largo and Stretto. What is this? What are they? Very roughly speaking, which is all that we're gonna need to get uh, to to get through this uh, in, in this course. Very roughly speaking, we're gonna go with the loosest understanding of Largo and Stretto that we can, which is this: that Largo, the Largo section, is broadly speaking, play at the tip to the middle of the sword, where the play is loose unconstrained, free, uh, sprightly, broadly speaking, okay? The classic, uh, the most classic sword, fighty sword stuff you can think of is probably going to be Largo-esque in, in, in flavor, okay? Whereas Stretto is going to be, broadly speaking, play that is um, uh, more constrained, um, it's going to have uh, Abrazare in it, and it's going to be close, right? It's going to be close, constrained, tight uh, play, okay? So that's broadly speaking what we're looking at, okay? And the reason why I'm being so I'm being so tiptoey here is because there's a lot of scholarly debate, uh, not only across the Fiore verse but in Emma itself about what makes each of these what it is what what's special what isn't what are things to you know what what definitions are relevant etc cetera, etc cetera, all right i definitely have my own views everyone everyone does have their own views uh, uh so there's a lot of interesting discussion uh and, and, and debate here but as, as i said just to get uh, through this for our purposes those two broad definitions are all that we need so largo loose free unconstrained play at the tips of the sword or maybe at the middle at, at most and strato close tight constrained play often involving grappling okay. so now that we're on that we're going to look at a sub a subspecies of this sword and two hand section we're going to look at largo specifically okay so in largo specifically we have um the sections broadly speaking divided between defenses against cuts and defenses against thrusts, okay? At the beginning of the Largo section, we deal with a lot of defenses against cuts. And when we have a defense against a cut, what we're generally looking, for, uh, looking at is we're looking at an opportunity for the defender to make a defense and deliver a blow that connects with their enemy all at the same time. There's a, a lot of words for this. Um, the Germans call this um, these sorts of things master strokes. Um, we we uh, uh, we like to say they're they're called single time actions. Um, but the the point is that w when you're defending cuts, we're often looking for a single response remedy to any attack that we that's presented against us. If we can't find one of those, we're often looking for a double time remedy which is commonly referred to in fencing a sort of parry repost so they give you an attack you defend their sword and put some energy into it 
and in the time that that energy is affecting the other person's sword you have done a second action and committed your sword to their body some sort of like a like a defense and a, and a hit something like that so and and, the, and these can be done regardless of what of, of what post that you're in whether you're lying on the right or the left high or low uh, you can make these defenses against uh, those kind of defenses against cuts now thrusts fury likes to defend thrusts with a, uh, attempting a single time a remedy especially if they're the certain kind of thrust thrusts in prime so when the um the hand is higher than the point when your true edge is facing 12 o'clock on the clock thrust and prime are very difficult it's not impossible to exchange you usually have to beat them and do other things but um these sorts of thrusts here this is the exchange of point play 26 va these sorts of thrusts where the enemy is giving it here fury is responding with a thrust or <laughs> fury is responding to a thrust with his own thrust and because of how you make the defense, you can defend the thrust and kill him all in the same action. Okay? In technical terms, that is a counter thrust in opposition. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kel. Right? I, so, a counter thrust in opposition. Now, why am I mentioning this? Alex asked about beats. Well, we understand, broadly speaking, at Emma, that though it's possible to beat swords down voluntarily, right? Just like with cuts, any beat is going to end up being a double time action, right? Even if everything went perfectly, we would have to beat the sword to the ground and then commit our sword to the other person's body. We can't hit them at the same time as we're beating the sword to the ground. Right? Physics just can't work that way. A sword can't be going down and up at the same time. Whereas if we exchange the point on a thrust, we have an opportunity for a single-time defense. So just like with the, against cuts, we're looking for, or at least this is how we, we like to often teach it at Emma, we're looking for the single-time remedy. And if we fail or the single-time remedy gets... Um, refused by the uh, by the uh, the enemy they 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 make a defense against it so you can't actually affect the single time remedy like turning their edge into your 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 defense or whatever if the single time remedy gets refused then you will move on to the next thing okay so with 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 um exchanging thrusts and beating thrusts to the ground we understand that we're going to try to exchange thrusts first and then if that fails for whatever reason we can then move to beating the thrust to the ground now alex this answers your question in a very specific way you said isn't it counterintuitive to beating thrust to the ground from a low starting from a low guard right well first of all Strictly speaking, we can always transit. Well, if we have the opportunity to, to transition to a different posta, we can change that very quickly, right? Number one. Number two, you can still throw a cut from high from this guard. It just takes a little transition. It's not really that big of a deal. So you can still cut down on it if you had to, if you have the time. That's number two. But most importantly, is that from low, uh, from full iron gate you can attempt an exchange of point and it's from the exchange of point where the swords are all where all, they're already engaged in something like post longa or an extended breve that is when the classic beating of the sword takes place as after they're already engaged Th this makes sense but uh... okay question when they're engaged yeah and you force the sword down yeah. does that count as a beat or like well, yeah. when i think beat i think of, <laughs> you know a... just a slap or whatever basically but if, if a sword is engaged does that count as sure beat? um so uh, that's a good question um we haven't really talked about blade engagements too uh too much yet um there are four classic blade engagements obliques beats binds and voids um 
so uh, and they're pretty much impossible to describe um, easy to show but in this case I would say that the act of bringing a sword to the ground after you've engaged it the act of beating it to the ground it's actually going to be something of a of an expulsion what we call an expulsion so an expulsion is an act that you perform against an enemy sword that you're already bound where you use some leverage to 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 force it to go in a certain direction right um, again hard to describe easy to show um, but obliques beats binds voids they're all something that describes sort of the moment that two swords which weren't touching now touch right an expulsion is an act that you can perform on a sword when you're already bound all right that i know that my question okay I, I, yeah that makes, yeah makes sense all right so i've done my best to describe those things i know i just use a lot of terms um kel do you want to <laughs> Did I get away with it, or uh, do you want to say? Uh... <laughs> well, it was pretty convoluted. Oh uh, yeah, I, um, I I know. I do apologize. If, if I can, if I can Please. answer Alex's question, mm. um, from Tutto Porto di Ferro, you make any of the cuts or thrusts, so you yeah. can cut Mezzano, right? So that, that's how you get to exchange a point. If you can cut. Uh, uh, a little bit above and then bring it back down like a short arc uh, in front of you so that you're sort of cutting the brevet mm. right mm -hmm. you can uh, beat a sword depending on on the contact that you make and of, of course the angle that the sword is coming towards you as well has a lot to do with it yes. but the idea of always beating a blade to the ground is counterproductive yeah. um and and it's it's useful when you have some sort of uh, stuck engagement if you're yeah. if you're at a, a point where you haven't got advantage but you don't have necessarily disadvantage you want to gain advantage as quickly as possible beating the sword to the ground completely takes mm. the sword out of out of the play mm -hmm. so how you choose to make your engagement is not really relevant to the yeah. posta itself the poster will allow you mm -hmm. to make any sort of engagement you want mm -hmm. and that's why it's the first post to demonstrate it does that help alex yep yep totally so. yeah so good uh, thank you for the the question it allowed us to kind of breeze by a lot of um a, a lot of big topics um <laughs> so again largo loose play stretto unconstrained play in largo they talk about defense against cuts and thrusts. And when we learn about, uh, about how to defend thrusts, we learn that usually beat the, the times when we beat swords to the ground, as Kel said, they um, often come more from situations where we're already engaged rather than, you know, coming together from, uh, for the first time. And, uh, and, and, and of course, not least, Full Iron Gate can make pretty much any cut. It can engage in any way. So, yeah. So lots to uh, lots to talk about, right? But these concepts again, we're gonna we're gonna see them time and again over the next twelve posters. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments about this one? No. Okay. Oh, almost forgot. Oh boy, that would have been terrible. The red text. <laughs> um, the red text. So there are, th um, there are three words um, that are said in the red text here, um, along with the post and name. So we're going to see we're going to see these three words over the next twelve posters. Um, Porta di Ferro gets the word pulsativa. So we're not. Um, this is another big scholarly topic. There's lots of uh, lots of ink spilled on it. Um, but what these three words mean, the colloquial sense is probably fine for us. Positiva meaning a strong poster that can give great defenses. You know, it can give very strong defenses. And he does say that in the text. Uh, do you want to add anything to that uh, to that, Cal? Yeah. Pulsativa? Oh, please. Pulsativa is a smite 
literally translates to smiting. And that's like in the biblical sense of being trashed physically. Um, so any of the Pulsativa guards can cast out great damage. And sure, it's a very good defensive position because it can make all the covers and make any of the cuts necessary to make the covers, but also can engage itself. It has a powerful position. Mm -hmm. uh, because the blade is, is somewhat withdrawn and you're going to move behind it, there's an awful lot of energy uh, mm -hmm. available. And uh, the other Pulsativa guards, you'll see the same thing. They're, they're, they're lined up to dash it out, man. Um, that's yeah. really more more uh, important is that Pulsativa can throw great blows. Throw great blows. Okay, so let's let's remember that as we we go through because it's not this isn't the last Pulsativa guard. No, oh, no, no, we're gonna see more. Pulsativa. Oh boy, <clears throat> Folio twenty three VB. Andrew, would you like to read this text for us? This is post a Nidana, which can execute all seven strikes of the sword, as well as defend against all of them. She can break all other guards with her great strikes, and is also quick to exchange thrusts. Perform an offline accrescimento with your front foot, then execute an oblique pass with your back foot. This leaves the opponent uncovered, enabling you to hit him quickly and surely. All right. Cool. Thank you. Posta di Donna. Uh, <clears throat> so those astute of you will remember that we started off the six guards uh, looking at two Posta di Donnas here. Fiore tells us they're the same guard, though one is refused and one is not. And when we see here, we see Posta di Donna and we see it is refused. So we see it, at least it's the refused kind. So, okay, fine. Um, here we go, Posta di Dona. We've seen it before. So he says we can execute all seven strikes of the sword and defend against all of them. What strikes is he referring to? Well, um, we, again, already saw that there are some cuts that we're going to come to, some cut figures. But... Most simply, I think, Fiore here is referring to the Senyo. So here's your seven strikes. Fendentes on the left and right, Metsani on the left and right, Sotani on the left and right. Reverso side, Drito side. And then the thrust up the middle, uh, signifying all thrusts, all the different kinds of thrusts. Fiore says there's five different kinds, but this is, this is for all of them, okay? So, um, yeah, so post that Dona can execute all seven strikes of the sword and defend against all of them. It can break all of the guards with its great strikes. Okay, see, that's, that's intuitive. I want to return to this one, execute all seven strikes of the sword. <laughs> if that's not kind of intuitive for some of you, then it ought to be. It can break all of the guards with its great strikes. Well, okay, so it's lying high. It seems like it could come down pretty hard. So, okay, great strikes, it's a high guard, it's coming down from above. Okay, that makes sense. It is also quick to exchange thrusts. Oh, interesting. Exchange thrusts. And then he gives some footwork. So, like I said in this first paragraph here, um, no, like, like I said in this one, wherever he gives us footwork uh, instruction, I, I always find it to be extremely, uh, extremely precious because he doesn't do that very often. Um, and it's a, it's a hint at the kind of technical uh, technical uh, instruction that he's capable of, but chooses not to give in so many, so many cases. So, um, so not only does he give us here some information about the guard, but he also gives us a play. Extend your front foot off the center line and pass at an angle with the back foot. This leaves the opponent uncovered and enabling you to hit him. So, um, it's very difficult to really get into this without being on the floor. So maybe, maybe it's, it's more worthwhile just to, just to leave that for the floor. So, um, put your front foot 
off the line. Okay, remember his front foot here is this foot, not this one, right? So right now his left foot is the front foot. Um, and uh, put it put it off the center line and pass at an angle with the uh, with the back foot. What exactly does he mean? We'd have to play down on the floor to show, but hopefully everybody here has an idea of what this might mean. Offline probably means to the left, rather than to the right, which would be more sort of across the center line uh, already. All right. Um, okay, let's return to the one, this one, this one word here, or this one sentence, which can execute all seven strikes of the sword and defend against all of them. And also, it is also quick to exchange thrusts. Okay, so um, what does this mean? And I want to actually open this up as a bit of a, not an exercise, but like, I do want you guys to think about this. Uh, I want us to have a think about this because um, all seven strikes, what does this mean? Can execute all seven strikes of the sword. Well, all seven strikes of the sword, okay. Fendentes, mezzanos, sotanos, and thrusts. So how can Posta di Donna throw all the strikes of the sword? What do you guys think? Anybody have any crazy ideas? Instincts? It'd be through a feint. So maybe you'd throw what starts off as a right fendente and after you pass your head, swerve around to the left. For a left uh, Fendente or Satani. Okay, so what would you be doing you're... when you would be swerving? Um... So, so do, uh, talk about that. Um, that. That's not a trick question. I want you to kind of expand on that a little bit. In your mind, how, how I... would that work? Yeah, I guess if you're throwing something from the left, that would be more of a trick, I guess. But as you're stepping out, maybe you clear your head and then just do a little <laughs> snap. Fendente or a snap Sotani. Well, like okay, so 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 a Sotani. Your so, head? I don't know. So how would that work or, throwing a Sotani? Just just very simply. How how do you think that might work? To carry the sword over your head, lower it a bit, and then snap <laughs> it back up. I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I suppose that's one way to uh, to think about it. Um, does anybody else other than Graham have a? Uh, <laughs> Have a, uh, I'm going to return. I'm going to return to you, Graham. It's a good idea, Graham. Yeah. Thanks. Beady here. Yep. So in some of the drills we've done at Emma Guelph, we've gone halfway through the Fendente to the point where your sword is at a 12 o'clock high position just off your right shoulder, just with your hands high. Mm-hmm. And then from there, transition to right fendente, left fendente, right mitsani, left mitsani, uh, right truage fendente satani, or left truage satani. Mm -hmm. The left side truage satani is more awkward, and it's a longer action, but you can make it work. Right. So, <clears throat> thank you, Beatty. So, what what um, Beatty and Graham are... Um, well, so what Beatty and Graham just did is they tried to describe or tried to imagine how we might do something like throw a Sotano from a LaDonna position or throw a, say, left Fendente when we're lying on the right in LaDonna on the right. D-Donna. D-Donna, I'm sorry, D-Donna. And what I want everybody to think about is I want people to think about whether or not, well, I want people to think about what transitions mean, basically, uh, right? Because this what is, you do a vote? Oh, sorry. yeah, so uh, I, I, I saved that question for just a second. I, I just want people to think about what transitions mean, okay? Because what we started off by looking at the posts, we started off by saying some posts are better at some things than others. Okay, so surely for throwing sotanos, the posts that are low 
are better at them than the posas that are high. And surely for throwing fendentes, the posas that are high are better at throwing them than the posas that are low. Well, okay, what do I mean by better? Well, if you're already high, if you're already in La Donna on the right, throwing a fendente drito is just very simple. It just comes right down, right? Couldn't be simpler. Whereas if you wanted to throw a fendente drito and you were low on the left, in left Akura Lunga or Boris Tooth on the left, that would be much more complex, right? So what I want everybody to think about, and I'm going to say this as evenly as I can because obviously I have my own opinions, I want you to think about what transitions mean and how transitions tie the posters together. Because I want us to take Fiore at his word here. Because he says that Posta di Donna can execute all seven strikes of a sword and defend against all of them. And that includes exchanging thrusts. So he basically says Di Donna can do, can do much. He can do, do pretty much everything. Right? He's, he's not quite as universal about it as, um, as Full Iron Gate, but he's, he's pretty, he says he can do a lot of stuff. Okay? So I, I want you to think about what um, what part transitions to other posters have in the identity of, you know, of an individual poster, right? Or what any individual poster can do. Okay, just want you to keep that in your mind before we go. Um, all right, I don't think I have anything else to say about this. Um, I don't really want to. I don't really want to talk about this play. It's just going to take too long, and it's it's not going to be satisfying. There's a play here. You can step off the center line. I think this is like the, um, the, the, uh, I think what he's talking about here is the, uh, peasant strike play, which we'll see in, in, in Largo, but I don't, you know, I don't really have much else to say. Um, did you want to say anything about this, Kel? I had to step away for a moment. Okay. Um, are, are, are we still on? Yeah. Are we still on posted it on? Yes, we are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm sorry if I missed something else. I had to no. step away for a moment. Basically, people say how do you throw a thrust from there have you talked about that no i i breeze by please please enlighten us okay well there are two options one you can uh rotate and and turn this into um finestra on the left and thrust from there or that's the, that way you'd be thrusting backwards or you can lift the cross above your head and the same way that you would begin to throw um Fendente Reversi, you can put it forward into a thrust, depending on how you move your hands, and then engage forward. Uh, so either of them is quite smooth. The Sotani are more challenging, uh, but basically they're based on the, how you move your feet. If you mm -hmm. have a, a, high, a high guard, in this particular case on the right, and you want to make your Sotano uh, true, then you can sweep down uh, basically through full iron gate and then back up again but it's a little slow mm. it doesn't have to be though because you can uh pause your feet a little bit while you're swinging it through that for, you're not entering before the sword is coming up so there's a little bit of uh play of measure and that's why the sword mm. section is after all the grappling and mm. the uh, dagger section because you've got to learn your measure at dagger right absolutely um, absolutely does, does anyone have a question about what i just explained can you visualize nope. it? You can't? No? Oh, no, I can't. I just, I, <laughs> I'm saying no, I don't, I don't think people have. I just see people just kind of like like leaning over their desks with their hands on their heads trying to visualize what the fuck we're talking about. <laughs> okay. well, which, anyway. which is a good aspect of these sessions. I suppose that's true. If, you're, <laughs> if your head hurts a little bit, you probably yeah. learned. Um, yeah. One comment I'd like to say, just building on yes. Kel's, uh, Kel's description, is uh, the importance of true time. Hmm. So we haven't really talked about true time yet either. We'll have to introduce that concept yeah, as well. well. Uh, you're never, you're never going to get, you're never going to get through the posters if you spend <laughs> jump into silver. True. No, we haven't. We know we haven't touched silver with a ten foot pole uh, yet. Um, uh, BD, uh, here's a good, here's a good exercise, BD. Describe true time in uh, a sentence. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs>
He and you brought it up. It's your fault. It's my fault. So true time is moving with time of the hand, then time of the body, then time of the foot, then time of the feet. That's the rote uh, uh, word by word definition. Um, Now, the simplest way of putting it is presenting a threat before presenting a target. There you go. Well done. All right. Well done. Beautiful. That's that's why we made you a scholar. Beautiful. (laughs) Yeah, and that's a and that's an important. Uh, he's also kind of funny too. So he's a uh, he's 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 a funny guy. Um, uh, yeah. So a, a moving um, presenting threats before we present targets is an important concept, which we uh, which we think is in Fury, of course, because it's a martial arts concept. But it's clearly articulated uh, in other places, and Emma has um, looked at those other places. Uh, previously to kind of get a description of it but uh, but yeah threats before targets very important um okay moving on all right we get a new word uh, posta di finestra instabile 23 vc uh to to bd would you like to read this one This is the posta de finestra, always quick to enact tricks and deceptions. She has mastery of defenses and offenses and can pick a good fight with all the guards, both the high and the low. She often goes from one guard to the other to deceive the opponent. She can deliver strong thrusts and knows how to break and exchange them, which are plays that she can execute well. All right. Sorgi e la poben fare. Yeah, weird how he kind of left that out here. Isn't that weird? Anyway, um, Aldo, Aldo hates Tom Leone's translation so much. That's so funny. Um, all right. Instabile. Uh, Posta di finestra instabile. Um, cool. Great. This is... um. I uh, I didn't appreciate how essential finestra was until really uh, I started doing Bolognese. Um I, I I don't know why it took me so long to figure it out, but uh, but yeah, this is a really important posta. It's a really important posta in in fencing. Um, so let's read the text first, and then I'll blab. Um, <laughs> this is posta di finestra. It's always quick to enact its tricks and deceptions. Okay, so he says that um, Fiore thinks that posta di finestra has tricks and deceptions incumbent in it. What those are, we'll have to wait to find out. She has mastery of defenses and offenses. Okay. So she's just as good at, you know. Uh, well, first of all, he he um, he feminizes posta di finestra, um, which is interesting because he does he feminize posta di donna? I didn't I didn't notice that. Yes. Yes. And posta di donna is variously translated as guard of the woman, but in a more strict sense, mm-hmm. it's the the lady, like the, the Okay. So he does feminize the lady that. of the household of somebody of nobility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. So it, I, 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 I was just about to say that the mm-hmm. uh posta de ferro tuta was also feminized. Oh, was it really? Oh it, shit. It, yeah, it said she. Oh shit, is it really? Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Very strong. How weapon? She can exchange thrusts. Holy fuck! Look at that! Wow, that's amazing. He feminizes this one too. That is so interesting. Maybe, oh, maybe. Oh man, maybe it's just Leone like giving the feminine. No. No, no. way. Eh? It's formally fe- Ella. No. Ella passa cum. Wow! Holy crap! That's really cool. That just blew my mind. I find that really neat, and I also kind of I'm kind of annoyed that these are men now. I don't. <laughs> he actually no, feminizes no, no, no. it in the text. That's that's very that's very interesting. No, 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 no. that has nothing. Has nothing. No, no, I know, I know. It, it would be cool if. Uh, anyways, anyways, I'm uh, moving on. No. Um, <laughs> same same uh, reason that that weapons are all female. Right, right, right. Boats are all female. Ooh. Ships are, you know, are all yeah. female. Um, okay, so um, she uh, she has mastery of defenses and offenses. Okay, fine. Um, 
it can pick a good fight with all of the guards, po uh, both high and low. Okay, so Fiore is saying, you know, read conventionally that Finestra doesn't have any particular weaknesses to other guards, as it were. Um, he's not pointing out any sort of critical deficiencies here. It's, it can pick a good fight with all the guards. Okay. It often goes from a guard, uh, from a guard to another, to deceive the opponent. Okay. Great. Now let's look at this word instabile. Okay. So a conventional reading of posta instabile, although of course, as like I said, there are many scholarly discussions about the three words. Right now we've seen two of them. Uh, we've seen usually, pos usually people that don't know anything about Italian. <laughs> well, you know, but isn't that isn't that often with Fiore? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. It is. So uh, usually, uh, I think uh, people read instabile in the again. Well, we're going to take it in the conventional sense anyway, which is that it is a guard that is not necessarily safe to lie in. So as opposed mm -hmm. to a guard like Posta Porta di Ferro, where Fiore says specifically it's a good guard to wait to receive attacks in, instabile guards are guards that you don't necessarily want to receive attacks in them. Or rather, rather, to be more specific, you don't necessarily want to lie in those guards. What that means then is that if this is not a guard that you that Fiore is saying you want to wait to receive attacks in, it therefore stands to reason that it's a guard that you're going to use in an engagement somewhere, right? Its principal utility isn't as a defensive guard that you lie in, wait to receive attacks, it's um, doing something else, all right? It's doing something else. So what is that thing? Okay, so not only does Fury say that it can employ lots of tricks and deceptions, and it can deliver strong thrusts, so obviously um, it it can make cuts, right? If it, you know, obviously it can make the Fidente cuts. It is really the same guard as Posta di Dona, except the point is shifted forward rather than back, but the hands are in relatively the same place. So if Posta di Dona can cut all seven strikes, then Finestra can probably cut all the, make all the strikes as well. It certainly in the text says it can do thrusts, and this fits with our experience. So it's like Posta di Dona in that it can do all the strikes, but it can also employ lots of tricks and deceptions. And we also note that it's point forward. And employing tricks and deceptions is common, it's a common uh, characteristic of point forward guards, because the point is tricky the point can be nebulous and tricky in the hands of a trained swordsman it's difficult to see yeah and even touching it which i've i've said a lot about how the certainty of touch is really the only thing that we want to better life our life on if we can help it even touching and engaging the point is not a guarantee that you know where it is because that point can move right and the italians are famous for perhaps slightly unfairly because everybody Who's a, you know who's who had sword culture, uh, you know new basic sword techniques. But the Italians are famous for what's called a cavitation, which is a dipping of the point above or below the point of engagement. Um, and it gets popularized in Italian fencing, of course. But the Spanish had it too, of course, and in others as well. Germans had it, and everybody. But uh, the point is 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 very tricky, very tricky by nature. That first third of the sword. Um, anyway, so what is, what's the big deal with Finestra then? If it's instability, okay, we don't want to receive attacks in it. Okay, fine. At least not directly. So how the hell do we use it? So as it happens, once we come to an engagement in fencing, we have a problem. Okay. Where's a, where's the logo section? Um, here we go. Perfect. Once we come to an engagement in fencing, we have a problem, okay? The problem is what to do next <laughs> now that the swords are touching, okay? Now, because of the nature of human bodies, sword engagements tend to rise. 
certainly what, as the engagement progresses, right? So the second, third, fourth actions, broadly speaking, in most engagements between most swordsmen, engagements tend to rise. The point of engagement tends to rise with each successive uh, action, uh, unless the skill of the swordsman changes that, right? And that's that's actually something that you can you can look at to to see the skill of of swordsmen that you're watching, um, uh, whether or not they're able to really vary the the um, the height of their engagement as it's progressing. But anyways. The swords are held by human beings, right? The arms are at the top of their body, not the not below. The head is something that human beings associate with themselves. You want to guard your head. You don't like things near your head. You're not so worried about your legs. Engagements tend to rise, and they tend to be focused mid-body and, and up. And also, people learn to turn their edges into engagements. Because turning your edges into engagements creates a bind between your edge and the opponent's. Sharp swords are sticky on the bind. And a lot of excellent fuckery that you train to do as a swordsman uh, is uh, is uh, inhibited by binding. A lot of it. Not all of it, but a lot of it. So... So the problem is once you've been, once you made a defense and you know if you haven't beaten the sword once you've gotten to a bind what do you do? Finestra is an amazing guard that allows you to continue to present threat as you transition to the next cut. So um, we're, oh, okay, let's get rid of these tabs here they're starting to confuse me. So Finestra here it's shown pretty refused right it's shown withdrawn and refused transitioning to post a finestra from an engagement is a standard method of preparing to throw on another fendente or another mezzani or even another sultani depends on what you're doing it's a standard method of throwing a second or third or fourth cut once an engagement has been achieved once a defense has been made and it's an amazing guard because you can make the transition while potentially threatening a thrust with the point. And if your opponent is really excluding the center, then that thrust will, threat will never be serious, but your next cut will be easy because he's already pushed you, he's already kind of ha helped you uh, half on the way. If he hasn't really excluded your center, then that thrust might be real and you might cause him to freak out and rush. And then make your cut better, or not defend the thrust, and you can and you can put it in. So Finestra is an amazingly deceptive and and useful guard. And once the swords swords are engaged, it's probably one of the most common guards to see in fencing. Next to so Posta Longa, um, uh, Posta Frontale, and Finestra, I would I would say very 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 common. So all of you will get to know Posta Finestra very well. As you learn how to fence, you'll get to learn to love it, and rely on it. Um, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a guard, a posta that is. It shines in the engagement, when the, in the active engagement. It appears all the time. Good morning, Connor. Sorry. So when you say engagement, like you don't mean like the sword's actually touching just them. Yes, I do. No, that's exactly what I mean. An engagement. So an engagement begins when the swords touch by conventional definition before the swords are touching you could stick your finger at your opponent you could you know insult them you could whatever talk about their mother and then they attack you then your sword comes out when the swords touch the engagement begins when the swords break off again when the measure separates then that engagement's over and another one can begin in the conventional Largo sense. So once the, once the swords are engaged, particularly when they're bound, Finestra becomes super, super useful and important. Um, you know, we already knew this before we started Bolognese uh, at Emma, but if there's anything that's 
reinforced that uh, to me a thousand million percent. It's definitely been um, looking at uh, Bolognese and also to some small extent uh, the rapier and the Spanish stuff that um, uh, that Maestro Ramon Martinez brought to us uh, a few years uh, for a few years. A finestra is also useful there. So it's great. It's a very great posta, not to be under underestimated, to be used a lot. Um, all right. Anything else on this one? Uh, like go, oh, go sorry, ahead, Beatty. No, Beatty, go ahead. So, uh, just at Guelph, we often tell our recruits, hands high or you die. So, <laughs> yeah, put your hands up to Finestra if you like your head. Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, um, instabile. So, it's certainly possible to receive thrusts in something like something that looks like a finestra. A conventional reading of this posta m may say that Fiore advocates against that, that there are other posters that he prefer you receive blows in. But if you if you did receive a blow, if you had to receive a blow here, or if this was, you know, part of an engagement that you had to use it in where maybe the swords come loose a bit and you have to receive something in finestra, you definitely want to make sure that it's not low, <laughs> that it's not chin height. You know, it's not like, um, what's that one poster from the Germans? Um, uh, Krieg or Flug? No, not Flug, but uh, uh, what's that? That stupid, ha the hanging. Is... They lay it across their arms. You know, that one, uh, Kel? What is, what is it? Uh, um, um, I, I don't know. That, that was in Meyer. Meyer, yeah, so, it's something like that. Where they there's a, there's a posta in in the later German stuff where like it's like Finestra, but they lay the sword across their like their armpit, like it's it's like underneath yeah, the but chin. It's a totally different sword. True, 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 true. Totally it's, different sword. Mm. Very long, very whippy. Um, true. One of the if you, if if Beatty's done there, I'm yeah. not sure. Did you have anything else to add? That was that's good. Yeah. Keep your hands high. Mm -hmm. um, the way I, I like to uh, remind people that are learning their posters or working through them is to simply, you know, as they as they make, uh, as they form the posta, take and slide my blade along the true edge. <laughs> it teaches them pretty quick because they see the thing coming towards their eyes or their forehead, you know, and it's just like, hey, is it working for you? No, maybe look a little higher. Um, and there's something else I'd like to mention mm -hmm. in, just in terms of the manuscript itself. In the Getty edition, mm -hmm. this is one of the few places where uh, blue is used, both oh. in, in the initial letter and both of his eyes are bright blue and they're looking directly out of the page at you. He's talking to you. He's showing you how to stand, but that you can see. You can see everything under that blade. You mm. out of there. You see, mm -hmm. you can see everything under that blade. Um, you notice how the crown is added afterwards, so it looks like it's uh, you know kind of it across is, yeah. his forehead. The blue that sword is kind of across his forehead. Well, he's holding it in that way so that he can see under it. We often talk about fenestra, uh, which of course means window, mm. uh, being something you can look out under a window sash. Mm. But the idea of it is protecting your head from above and also having a clear view of everything all around you, including the people that might be beside you or even Mm -hmm. uh, to to the other side, you know, so you can you can move your head around and still protect it. it uh, the stance doesn't uh, force you to be static. Now, as far as the instabile uh, terminology, the best description lately in uh, discussions that have involved actual Italians, as opposed <laughs> to people that learned it as uh, you know from their grandparents, uh, it's mutable, not. Uh, unstable is a really wrong mm. thing. It does not work mm. out to unstable. Instabile sounds to an English speaker like it's something that's unstable and not mm. strong. You can't stand there. Mm. So I will disagree with you about not being able to lie and wait there. It's mutable is is, li sure. is uh, sure. the, mm. the common translation. And that means changing, always mm. changing. So it's something that you're not going to stand perfectly still in mm. until you can find some advantage, mm. and then you'll provoke that advantage. Mm -hmm. um, 
I've had many, many times staring down uh, my playmates or or people that I didn't really like, uh, where it's <laughs> standing. I don't uh, typically stand with this position refused. I like to go forward with it and actually be a serious threat. And uh, although, you know, the refused position is useful because it allows you to generate quite a bit of energy with your body turn. Mm. Um, either way, it, it can be forward or back. As he says nothing about how it's used. But in this True. particular image, he's showing you that it can see everything. It's very, very important. Yeah, thank you, Cal. And I, I want, also want to highlight something that you said um, that let's remember with all of these refused positions that though in the refused position the lead leg right is is the is this one right the lead leg is the one that has 40 percent and the trailing leg is the one that has 60 percent of the uh what's the percentage sorry whatever <laughs> though that's true he's also in a standard stance in this direction and he's in post the didona in this direction on the only thing that will have to change is his head if he's looking in this direction he's in a uh, a refused finestra right if he's looking in this direction he's in a unrefused didona does everybody get that everybody see that and all that the only thing that would need to change is his head really right is where he's looking so this is this shows you the uh, incredible utility of the volta stabile um where it can play it can play 180 degrees on the same side and it can turn it can basically allow you to sh to, to fight t two sides at once effectively right to 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 be forward and aggressive in one side and in, um uh, in, inviting in the other and then switch that at a uh, at a moment's notice so very uh, very cool very very cool um okay moving on moving on if it seems like we're moving a little slowly i told you guys that there's a lot in the posters so this is um this is all great stuff and we we never really get in depth in these on the floor anyway so this is one of the only times we're going to actually <laughs> get to bend your ear about this stuff. So, um, yeah, enjoy it. Uh, okay, Fo uh, Folio 23 VD. Here we go. Connor, soothe us with those mellifluous tones. Well, how do I sound first? Beautiful. Is it clear? Wonderful. This is the left posta di donna, always quick to the defense and offense. She can deliver great strikes, break thrusts, and beat them to the ground. Thanks to her knowledge of traversing, she enters the close play. This guard knows all these things well. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. That was very James Earl Jones of you. I thought it was, yeah, I can't, I can't decide whether it's like Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones. No, 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 no. Oh, you think you, you think it's more James Earl Jones? Interesting. Oh yeah. Interesting. At, at the camping weekend, we decided he was the movie trailer guy. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. We'll have yeah. to we'll have to do we'll, have, we'll, we'll get you to do the new uh, the new Emma uh, advertising Connor, video. Gets, gets his ass out of bed in the wee hours to hey, come and talk. To we us. can still break and his balls when he's in China. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, we love you. Get get back here already, for Christ's sake! Come on, it's been too long. All right, um, would be forty eight days. Forty eight days. Cool. Woo. That's great. That's awesome, awesome. Um, all right, Folio twenty three VD. So left posta di donna. Um, here we go. It's postativa, which is great. That should fit our expectation. Um, this is posted di donna la finestra. Is that, is that what he says in the text? Oh, la sinestra, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. Left posted di donna. Um, always quick to the defense and offense. Okay. She can deliver great strikes and break thrusts and beat them to the ground. This we know. Um, we're we're expecting the left posted di donna to share the characteristics of the right posted di donna, right? So um, sure enough, it does. And thanks to her knowledge of traversing, she enters the close play. That's interesting. That's different from the right post of Didona. She knows, uh, this guard knows all these plays well. 
all these things well. So this, okay, mm, let's, okay, let's back up just a touch and let's talk about footedness because we haven't really, all oh, these goddamn tabs, we haven't really talked about footedness that much. So what do I mean by footedness? So strictly speaking, all we mean when we say footedness is when we're describing a figure, whether it's, you know, yourself on the floor or whether it's a figure in fury. When we're talking about footedness, we're usually meaning simply which foot is forward and which foot's back. Okay, what is the footedness of, you know, whoever, right? In scholarly discussions of Fury, there is, there are, or there are lots of debates about the significance of footedness, specifically because the only evidence we have of the footedness of the posta is usually the picture. Most of the time, we don't have direct uh, textual evidence to corroborate the footedness shown in the images of the pictures. Now, that's don't get me wrong. That's not me doubting the veracity and the importance of the footedness of the images, right? I, you know, though I tend to be a textual guy myself, we just spent uh, some time last class talking about how putting a finger over the cross guard of post Sagittaria shows you a way to spin the sword, right? So again, I'm not doubting the veracity of the images but I am bringing it up as something to think about because it's possible that the posta here are shown very explicitly with a certain footedness, with a certain specific footedness. And if that's true, if we do assign the specific footedness to the posters, and by and large, at Emma, we tend to do that, we tend to assign a specific footedness to the posters. If that's true, then that gives the posters different attributes. That or that that further that further um, adds to the attributes of a posta: what it's good at, what it sucks at, what it can do, what it can't do, etc. Because remember, the lead hand of this sword, though it is held in two hands. The lead hand of the sword is the right hand. The left hand can come off, can come on, it can enter in, it can do all sorts of stuff. The left hand is, you know, for for lack of a better word, along for the ride. I'm not saying it's not important, but the left hand is along for the ride. That right hand is super critical. It's a right-handed weapon used by people who are, by and large, right-hand dominant right so the right side and the left side are different now how significant this is is up for question right very interesting uh conversations to be had there but the right and the left side are different here okay now why does this all matter who cares left post the didona fiore says something unique compared to right Posidonis. He says she enters the close play. Thanks to her knowledge of traversing, she enters the close play. I'm not going to discourse on, on what, what this might mean, but I'm going to suggest that one reason for this may in fact be that left Posidonis is drawn with the, the left foot back. And a lot of entries in the strato section involve a passing step of the left foot into the position followed by an entry with the left hand. And because the left hand is the, going to be the dominant entry hand, because the right hand is important, as we just as, as we just said, this should make sense to us. This should make intuitive sense that entries in the sword and two hand are going to be common from passing steps with the left foot, passing steps in, bringing that left hand in, 
getting into that position, getting in there. So we and we could figure this out independently of this poster, right? We don't need this poster to tell us. But this poster corroborates something which we should already know, especially from the dagger, right? Especially from the dagger, that these left-handed entries, left side, left-hand entries are going to come up a lot. And so sure enough, when we're looking at a poster with the left foot back, right, ready to pass in to, to, to get to Stretto, sure enough, Fiore says, <laughs> e entra in lo jogo stretto per lo suo save traversare. Thanks for to knowledge of uh, traversing. She enters the close play. Um, th this guard knows all these plays well. So, as you guys, well, as we continue to look at the plays, the posters, um, also consider footedness, right? Also consider footedness to how, to, how we understand these things. Okay. Um, anything to add there, Kel? Well, um, or subtract. Very circuitous, circuitous route to get to where we are. But um, normally, when you break an attack from the opposite hand, for example, if uh, the enemy, as you like to say, or Zugadori, mm -hmm. as I prefer, uh, attacks with a standard right-hand attack and, uh, of a common fencer, mm -hmm. the presented uh, the right shoulder being presented in. Uh, this particular guard is a, a is a lovely invitation mm -hmm. provocation so uh, the attempt to be tricky in this situation in a in a straightforward attack mm. is likely to be met with a strong beat from a left fedente or a left mezzano and that beat is going to swing the body through uh, the defender's body, in this case, the, the ground master, is going to swing him through either forward or backwards because this is a position that can step back as well. The sure. left leg mm -hmm. can retreat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this position, you're going to traverse a little to control the center line and either get closer or allow your, uh, your Zubidori to get closer to you, depending on how you manage your footwork. Mm -hmm. So the strong beat from the left against mm -hmm. a strike from the attacker's right is going to send them farther off the center line. So anytime you see someone in a left guard in any of these guards or any of your fencing, know very well that if you throw a common attack, it's going to be beaten aside and you will be roughly handled. <laughs> and perhaps the centurion will throw you roughly to the floor. <laughs> very roughly. Very roughly. For those of you who anyway, uh, who don't get that joke, there's lots of COVID Monty, left. Please watch Monty life, Python. <laughs> life of Brian. <laughs> Biggest uh, ticket. Big... Anyways, yeah. it's it's right. a very important thing whenever you see someone in a left position, and mm -hmm. this is explained very clearly in the spear section. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're in recruit class, you don't get to that point, mm -hmm. and it, there it's an absolute necessity. That's why he spells it out so mm -hmm. clearly. But uh, you know the whole the whole manuscript is self-referential, and yeah. in this particular position, he's showing you some basic stuff that's going to work against a common fencer. Yeah, there's the soapbox open. All right, okay, left posta di donna. Next, oh boy, oh we've come to the come to the big guy. Posta Longa, Folio 24RA. All right. Uh, who's next? Uh, Graham, would you like to read this text for us? Sure. This is the Posta Longa, full of deception. She can probe the opponent's guard to see if she can deceive him. If it is possible to strike with a thrust, she knows how to do it. She also knows how to avoid cuts and then, uh, then deliver them when it is possible. More than other guards, she can employ deception. Whew. Okay, Posta Longa. Uh, also feminized. Again, I guess this must be a theme. They all are. Yeah, they all they are. All it's are. very, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, all right, so Posta Longa. How to even begin? Well, first of all, let's start at the, 
the start of the text. Um, the text describes Posta Longa in a very particular way. In a very particular way. It can probe the opponent's guards to see if it can deceive them. Okay. That implies that you're in Posta Longa and you're doing something to the opponent's guards while in Posta Longa. Okay, so that's that's number one. It can probe the opponent's guards to see if it can get deceive them. It can strike with a thrust. Okay, that makes sense, right? It's point forward. You could all you have to do to thrust is step forward with it. Okay, it can strike with a thrust. It knows how to avoid cuts. Okay, that's curious. We'll return to that later. And then deliver them when it's possible. Okay, avoid cuts and deliver them when it's possible. My reading of this is through posta finestra. Avoiding cuts, and or you could also read avoiding cuts as, you, as talking about cavitations, but that's not my instinctual reading. I think it's he's talking about finestra. Finestra and longa go to... Oh, oh no, the code, don't look. Um, finestra and posta longa go together like, like, I don't know, two things that go together. <laughs> they get, they're... they're they're brothers or sisters. They, you know, for every posta longa, there's usually a finestra, at least at least one, right? You can you can cut. Well, okay. And why is that, right? Why are posta finestra and posta longa really important? This is because every cut and every thrust has its conclusion at posta longa. Now, posta longa here is only shown in one hand position. We talked about hand positions a couple weeks ago when we were looking at the sword in one hand. I think I used it by describing the uh, palm, I think. Maybe it was the thumb. I think it was the thumb I used. Where you have the thumb down in, in prime, you have the thumb to the left in second, you have the thumb in uh, up in third, and the thumb to the right in fourth. So posta longa can be in any one of those positions, first, second, third, or fourth, with two hands on it or one, though it is only shown in third position here with the thumb up. Because that provides the longest reach. Yes. Yes. Um, and But regardless, all cuts have their finish at posta longa because posta longa as a is the posta with the longest reach third is the is the probably the farthest reach of the four but uh posta longa is the posta with the farthest with the farthest reach so um so on top of posta longa being able to do things on its own it's also the posta that every other well that most yeah. other most other things are going to end up here of a defensive nature yeah. almost almost yeah. everything through yeah. Not and pass well, uh, uh, or or pass through. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Or, or pass is, through is the apex right? of the arc. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so this this posta more than any others. This this posta is critical to all of our fencing, and it's the most common thing that we deploy. Ultimately, it's the most common thing we deploy. So, um, not only can it do lots of things on its own. But um, m most other offensive actions move through or end up at posta longa. So it's a very, very critical, critical posta. Uh, most of the time, posta longa is too short when people uh, depl deploy it. And I include myself in that, of course. You have to work explicitly to get a good, in a good um, expression. A post longa to to really kind of sink your knees in and get it get it comfortably long. Most people's post longa is pretty damn short compared to what they could do, uh, but that's that's something to take to the to the saw when we get back. But it is well, it, it, it is a well expressed posta. It should have some serious length uh, to it. it. It's very clearly demonstrated here mm, that mm. the knee forward knee does mm. not pass the forward toe. Right. Very clear. So. Making yeah. a stable but mm. long 
position yeah. requires that much extension. Yeah. One of the things that go on throughout the entire Getty mm -hmm. is fairly deep stances, mm -hmm. especially in the grappling section. Mm -hmm. When you compare the same plays in the Novati or mm -hmm. the Pizzani Dossi, some people like to call it, mm -hmm. um, the stances are much more upright. Mm -hmm. They're not as deep and solid. Um, this is a particular expression of it right here in, in this guard where he's gone full out. Mm -hmm. He's gone as far as he can without overbalancing himself. So it's something to strive for, as you say. Yeah, and, and that's it. The, what you said, Carl, is critical there without overbalancing. Um, we like to um, – this is one of <laughs> one of the few, the few uh, um, joys that we can get away with uh, of making fun and shaming people nowadays is making fun of them for teapotting. <laughs> Um, when you, and, uh, so, uh, Edema Toronto, and I'm sure I, I know this for a fact at Guelph too, we make fun of new students all the time for doing what we call teapotting and teapotting is when, um, is when this, this foot kind of rises and this knee goes over this toe and people, uh. people try and reach a little farther. They can't actually reach farther really, but it just looks ridiculous. Um, and it's really bad, really, really, really unstable. Um, well, but I'm it's something gonna, that we I'm do. Right? Say I, I don't approve of the, uh, you know, uh, making, you know, making fun of anybody. <laughs> I really don't approve of that, except, except in your case. Oh, all right, all right. I see how it is. That's fine. Well, that's uh, fine. I'm cool. But, um, I'm, I'm uh, of the opinion that one of the ways that I can easily demonstrate this to someone that just doesn't understand it, they can't physically feel it, mm. because it's one thing to watch somebody else do something, and if you're not particularly well in touch with your body and what new student is, uh, yeah. if they tell them to make post -a longa and then just tug on their sword, right? they'll figure it out real quick. Yeah, uh, uh, that's right. And so the the takeaway there, of course, in all in all seriousness, is to um, to remember. Aaron. Rem <laughs> no, never, n never that, never that. <laughs> to to remember. To remember, I'm 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 so glad, Kel. I'm so glad. Um, <laughs> it's to remember that the feet need to remain planted, like an elephant's. We haven't talked about the segno yet. I I can't wait till we do. But uh, stability. Oh, that's the whole night. Yeah, I know. It's it's gonna be it's gonna be a good night. Um, uh, st stability, uh, fortitudo, is absolutely key uh, to this. And one of the one of the takeaways that we're lucky enough as Fury students to have um, beaten into our heads from wrestling and from dagger is that fortitudo is a critical component of us as a, as a fighter. And that's that's a funny point to make, not to us. But it's a funny point to make when you bring that out to the wider fencing community. And I say fencing with air quotes because there's so much different types of fencing out there. So many different styles of interpretations of different things. And, you know, a Fury students that really, like, really, really value Fortitudo. Once you start to look at a whole bunch of different kinds of fencing out there, I really do think you get scandalized very quickly with respect to how you see people using Fortitudo, or rather the lack thereof. There's lots of crazy stuff out there, or to us, um, valuing two feet, two feet on the ground, solid stances all, all the time. Uh, there's lots of really crazy, uh, well, I say crazy, different things out there that um, fly in the face of that. And, uh, you know, everybody has the different opinions about it, of course. Obviously, I'm not a big fan of, of things that don't don't uh, emphasize Fortitudo, but um, it's... It's it's yeah it's something that is um, I don't know if it's unique to Fury I don't know if that's fair to say but it's important no, to Fury it's not yeah um, it's only it's only unique to real fencers <laughs> and real wrestlers <laughs> yeah. as opposed to tag fencers yeah people that play for sport events. yeah one of the one of the uh, as a as a brief aside I shouldn't say this but I'll say it one of the fascinating things that I've learned about um, advanced fencing from uh, a lot of the the really good rapier guys and the bolognese guys is that the actual the actual key to fast fencing like to real quickness is solid fortitudo that seems counterintuitive but it isn't it's precisely the opposite it's it's key the guys who have the best control uh, on the ground the best grip on the ground 
they can move move freely, truly freely. Um, and, and they can generate power more easily. Oh yeah. So that oh, their, yeah. their hands, their hands are merely targeting implements yeah. as opposed to power generation because they're generating yeah. the power basically below their hips. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that goes through throughout all fencing and 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 also yeah. Asian fencing. The vast yeah. majority of Asian fencers generate their power uh, below their hips. You know, they're they're uh, mm -hmm. really really solid on the ground. When you mm -hmm. watch. Uh, Japanese uh, ajits of people, mm -hmm. man, it looks like they got Velcro on their soles of their feet. Mm -hmm. They're really, really stable, and their knees are deeply bent. Mm -hmm. But they're generating all the power from their hips and their knees uh, because they don't move on their feet so much as we do. We we, we tend to rotate on the on the balls of our feet, the metatarsals. Mm -hmm. uh, in in Asian fencing, you know, that's that's like no 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 don't do that. And um, yet yeah, with Fiori, that's all the pivoting mo motions and the turning motions. Uh, Japanese fencers turn on their heels. And when you watch them, they have to turn and settle before they can move. And, and it's a process, but uh, a Fiorist can move much more quickly, much more like a, a basketball player or a dancer. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you something, if you couldn't dance in noble uh, society, <laughs> You were considered a bumpkin, right? So they wouldn't really consider you worthy of being in their company if you couldn't dance. Yeah, Rob, really uh, uh, the uh, one of the program directors of the ROM had me doing um, a, a medieval dancing at a ROM festival for many years because he, mm -hmm. he kept telling me, uh, never trust a sword to a man who can't dance. And I, I yeah, thought and that's going to trigger it. Attributed yeah. to Confucius as an old Irish yeah. saying, apparently, and blah blah blah. blah. Yeah, but if, you I know, I agree. <laughs> I do agree. Well, if if you uh, if you if you know someone who really wants to be trusted with a sword, and you tell them that, then you'll you'll get them to dance. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, fuck you! I can dance. No, I, I can do it. Whatever. It's just whatever. Just just tell me how to do it. <laughs> um, it's it's very interesting. Uh, you, it's fine. Uh, most it's people funny. wouldn't know this, but. Yeah. Uh, Major League NFL football has a long tradition of sending their forward linesmen to ballet class. Really? And as ridiculous I did not as know that. seeing a large black man the size of a refrigerator, uh, they don't bother to put them in tutus, obviously, but they, they send them to dance class and they're you know, like they're given the very basics that you would a, a six or seven year old child of how to move and how to stay light on their feet because uh, a linesman can't be nimble enough to sidestep. He's going to have to strong his way through every single hit and there's always someone bigger and stronger. So if he can slip and change foot in this um, slide a little to the side that kind of thing mm -hmm. can be the difference between him getting through the line or him getting taken down by someone bigger all right it's a very important mm -hmm. thing and, and and there was a there was a, a a big joke with rosie greer a famous uh, football player from the from the uh, early 80s at late 70s early 80s in he actually put the 2 2 one Oh yeah, and he got a giant sized tutu. The man weighed three hundred pounds, right? But he got the tutu and put, did a big smile, and he had a whole bunch of little kids, like like little kids, mm. dancing with him. And he said, between this and knitting, and that was his other hobby because he had hypertension. Mm. Between that and knitting, these are the things that help me keep calm. Oh, that's a good. Very story. interesting yeah. stuff. So, yeah. uh, those of you that think you know it's. it's Fighting is all manly and, you know, yeah, I'm sure there's a certain amount of, you know, you got to step up to the line and not step back. But the culture that this weapon and this uh, art was developed in included music and poetry and dance and uh, the culture of food, riding. Riding well was very, very important. Yeah, it's it's not and just the, you know murder. Yeah, that would be boring, yeah, you know. Yeah, exactly, exactly <laughs> that. So it's a thing. It's a thing that is very good for uh, <laughs> students, as, as most of you are, to keep that in mind. This is not some sort of you know uh, what do they call it? Nin, ninjutsu in Italy. Uh, this is another. Who calls it of that? Very highly. 
Uh, I've heard it called that oh. by German guys. Oh, well, yeah. they're weird. Oh, they, they, uh, quite a few, uh, I've, I've heard say, all oh, you Fjords are all dancers. It's like, well, that's because uh, you Germans are all luds, yeah. you know, like you're clod yeah. hoppers. Yeah, yeah. You get a sword, you treat it like an axe, yeah. right? Yeah. And, uh, well, it's always fun to making fun of uh, the left and hour people. Oh, you like, gotta have enemies. Meyer people. If you don't yeah, have enemies, Meyer who are you gonna people, fight? They move their feet. The Myers <laughs> move their feet. Uh, yeah. All, all right. Uh, all right. Back well, to back to the doing. thing. Back to the thing. Um, for, uh, Folio twenty four RB, uh, Porta di Ferro Mezzana, Middle uh, Iron Gate, Stabile. Our third word. Our third word. Who are we at? Uh, Kel. Would you like to? Or, I can't. Okay, no, uh, my screen okay, is cool. too small. No problem. No problem. Um, who, who am I looking at? Mark. Yep. Um, yep. Mark. Mark. Yes. 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 This is Porta de Ferro Mizana, middle iron door. Since it holds the sword in the middle, is a good guard. Calls for a long blade. Delivers strong thrusts. Eats away attacks low to high comes back down with a fendente to the head or arms. Returning in this guard, it is called posta, uh, porta, door, because it is strong. It is a strong guard that is difficult to break without danger and without coming to the close. All right. Thank you, Mark. Well done. Porta di Ferro Mezzana. All right. So, middle iron gate. Now, First thing to say is a brief comment about footedness. There is um, definitely a debate in Enema about the footedness of this guard. Um, of all the guards, because you guys, you no. guys can't read. <laughs> Wait, Cal, Cal, I did it with the Bolognese stuff. You, <laughs> This is fury. <laughs> so, I I really do try to be even when I describe these things. So, just, so several there are there are different opinions at Emma about the footedness of this guard. <laughs> several might exist in this room uh, in this chat. <laughs> um, some believe that it's important that this guard is in uh, the uh, the described footedness, the drawn footedness that. Porta de Fenomezzana has a specific nature uh, with the right foot forward, as it's described. And then uh, there are those that study the Bolognese as well and think that they can transplant it 200 years back. That's that's right. Then there are those who might be wrong, <laughs> who, who, who say that because the sword is in the middle, that um, the nature of Porta de Fenomezzana is not is not limited strictly to the left foot being forward, but it, it is the same or uh, nearly identical with the right foot forward as yeah, well. Great. Read the, read so, the text. So that's the, I just said, I pointed out that's, that is the thing that's an open discussion right now. Who's, who's right. Who knows? Um, but that is the thing, right? And I, I do think in all seriousness, this is that that's an important thing to remember because I want it to, I, I want to again, um, remind you guys to think about, the footedness of postas, right, and how important it is to their to their nature. Sometimes I think it's obviously critical, um, perhaps, and other times it isn't. But it's that's something for you guys to consider in your study. Okay. Um, now, put the defender mats on it. It's a good guard, but calls for a long blade. All right. So as uh, as opposed to middle iron gate, when he says the blade should not be too long. Full iron gate. A uh, full iron gate. Sorry. He, for for this post, the middle iron gate, he says it's well, depends on how you read better this. With a long better with a long better sword with a long. or needs a long a long blade, but Call, at least calls good. Calls for is a good description. Yeah, calls for a long done. yeah, a, a calls yeah. for a long blade. Um, this is should probably fit our intuition because, um, as you can actually see here, uh, this post. Uh, is set up set opposite to posta longa here and there's really not that much difference between them um you know posta longa yes it's outstretched right it's fully extended but um posta uh, a porta de ferro mezzana is i mean it's almost the same right 
the extension is is uh, very near, right? The extension is very easy to do, and the length the, the the point is deceptively forward, right? One of the things that you learn in in fencing is to understand where the points of your enemy's guards are, even though they're not deployed yet. Because as someone who's really trained their post the transitions, and it's one of the reasons why we harp on it all the time, someone who's really trained their transitions can deploy from even point backward guards, they can deploy points pretty pretty quickly. And so you want to have an, a, a fairly accurate notion, a spatial notion of where a point is, quote unquote, even though it's not deployed there quite yet, right? That's very important. So, and as it happens, someone who has a, a very, very good uh, and legendarily, if I may say so, uh, spatial uh, judgment is, is Kel, as a matter of fact. Um, and you, you see him actually, uh, I think maybe more than anyone else, uh, use a refused postus. And that those two things probably go together very well, right? Because he, he, he has a great judgment of where other people's points are. And if After they, forty it, years, yeah. I finally figured that out. Yeah, yeah and if, and if they don't all, don't also have the same judgment, then they can also make mistakes in measure, which um, if they make them, if they make those mistakes, and Kel doesn't, that puts Kel at a huge advantage. So um, that's all that is to say. It's important to know where swords are or where they can be, even though they're not they're not there yet. But Porta de Ferro Mezzana is almost post longer. That's the point. A long blade would be would be better. Um, so it's going to have some, uh, it's going to share some characteristics with uh, Posta Longa. It delivers strong thrusts, beats away attacks, low to high. Okay, great. And then comes back down with a Fendente to the heads and arms, returning in this guard. So here he's describing, you know, we know we can deliver thrusts. It's point forward guard. Okay, fine. But it can also beat attacks away and then return with a Fendente. So this is, in all likelihood, describing reactions to cuts, because it is a low guard, reactions to cuts with the false edge. It's often possible to get great deflections or beats from cuts from above uh, with the false edge of the sword. And because the sword is in the middle, it can engage both Oriversi and Drito cuts. Perfectly fine. So very versatile in that regard. And it sets up a nice double time action, uh, a deflection with a cut following downwards to the head or arms or whatever. So that should fit with our intuition, but it's great that Fiora said it, right? It's great that Fiora said it. Um, it is called Port the, um, the Door because it's strong, it seems to share some characteristics with Full Iron Gate. It is a strong guard that is difficult to break without danger and without coming to the close. Um, this should fit with our intuition, um, not only because it, it seems to share some characteristics with Full Iron Gate in that it's strong and low, but also because this guard is point forward without having the point in the middle, which is why this guard has become more and more a favorite of mine as the years go on. Because, you know, as opposed to Posta Longa, or Posta Breve, or Posta Frontale, or even um, Bicorno, all of those guards, they're point forward guards, but the point is in the middle. And it's possible for the enemy to cross and engage the point, or attempt to do so, or, or provoke the point in some way. All of those guards have that opportunity, in them, right? It's not a weakness, it's just a fact. It's almost impossible to do that realistically against the middle iron gate because the point is low and you're you're very bizarre if you try and cross the point that is low that's a very bizarre strategy to do right so it's a, but but the point the point is low but it's forward right so it's very very interesting very unique guard uh please go cal this is a guard that most cheap fencers uh, I say cheap because they like cheap shots. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. Cheap indeed. Take hand, hand shots from this guard. Ah, uh, also. So indeed. they'll wait mm. for you to come close to them and then they'll snipe the hands. <laughs> I mean, Murph, Murph does it. <laughs> I, I'm sure other people do. 
uh, I, I know Christian Cameron's group, mm. there's a lot of that do that because they don't want to engage. They just want to score points. They figure, oh, I can touch your hands easily. Well, it's true, but it's a guard that can be broken by beating the point down. So you have to uh, forgo your actual attack, create an attack that they're willing to counter, and then switch to a crossing. So you yeah. make a crossing roll and then enter into close plays on them. Everyone that I've ever done this to that likes to snipe hands, including Murph, ends up on the ground <laughs> every time. So what? What? Cal- uh, yeah. David Ito, David yeah. Ito was really into this. He said, "How do you how do you practice it? How do you practice it? <laughs> well, it's a deception. You just have to practice changing from something to another thing. And later on in the plays, you'll see one called uh, the Punta Carta, a uh, False point. A punta curta e falsa. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, False point play was is a complete deception. Right. Mm -hmm. So, it's not that you can't deal with this guard that way. You can break this guard by Mm -hmm. crushing down on it. And there's a a fairly similar guard in uh, the Lectonaric tradition that's very rarely used because it's so easy to break from a high position, because you can try to snipe the hands, but if you're throwing a blow at somebody's temple, um, they're probably going to be more worried about their face than they are about trying to hit your hands because it's not going to stop the blade from hitting them in the face. In any case, um, I just wanted to point that out. Mm. This is a guard that is very strong, but Mm. also can be used poorly Mm -hmm. uh, because it's a, it's thought that it's a, Mm. a, a simple, simple thing to work with and uh for cheaters and for people that that don't really want to put in the work they just want to score points this is a guard that they'll try to use because they can score hand points although in tournaments i don't think most hand points are are accepted no not uh, anymore usually not yeah but the the, the thing of it is a lot of free fencers that are of modest uh experience will try to use it because they'll try to punish your hands um well it's no fun getting smashed on your ass uh, by yeah. by someone that can wrestle. So basically, that's how you deal with someone who's trying to hand snipe. And for those of you that are uh, you know looking to move up to scholar candidate when uh, when Emma gets back into action, you know something to keep in mind because if you fall into this and try and hand snipe, mm-hmm. somebody with more experience is going to knock your sword down and then kick you and you know mm-hmm. shove you on your butt. Well, and not okay. and not least, uh, and let me uh, let me get on my own soapbox very briefly on it, since you brought up hand shots, Cal. It's your fault. Uh, uh, not least, you know, it's you know, hand shots in fencing. I mean, they're obviously they're a good thing in isolation. Like if you can hit the hand, then you you know stop the sword arm. Right? It's fantastic. Hitting the arm, arm is great too. Um, hands are obviously the easiest part of the arm to hit because they're the closest that come to you, and we're only dealing with simple, uh, simple cross guards here. So I mean, so in isolation, hands hand shots are great, but 90% of the time that I see them done, they're done to the exclusion of someone's defense. So someone gives an attack that's threatening you. Uh, if you're the defender, and you say, instead of taking your def- your attack seriously, I'm going to try and hit your hand as it's coming in or whatever. And th- I think that this is a classic example of a decision-making process that is only allowed to exist because we're school fencing with blunts. Yes. It's natural. Totally. It's, an, it's a natural... Uh, and, I, and I'm not saying it's 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 a... Um, I'm not saying it's even bad for, or like, it's a natural thing for school fencers to be attracted to this thing, because it, it's 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 endemic to their natural environment. You're not fencing with sharps in a school, and you're trusting partners and and you know whatever. So why not have it as a thought in your mind? So that's not the important thing. Is not that the thought occurs to you. It's to contextualize it. And like the, you know, we, we did a good job of this in old Emma, or I should say we, I shouldn't say we because I was a recruit then, but, you know, emphasizing we're training with sharps and trying to inculcate that sharps mentality is super important um, so we can avoid 
falling into the trap of our current circumstances. Just because we train with blunts yeah. doesn't mean we have to look like it, you know? Dave Savette likes to call it the invincible warrior syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. As long as we keep it in, as long as we keep it in mind, um, we, uh, we're okay, right? We can, we can fight through it. Um, but, uh, it's, it's an important thing to, to remember. Um, okay. So I think, um, how many, how many guards is that? Is that six? Did we get actually through six? We no. got one, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Six. There we go. So we got through half the guards. It's 10 o'clock. Um, we, uh, we actually covered a lot of concepts today, a lot of big topics. Um, this was a, a great, uh, a session. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything we've talked about today? How many of your, how many of your heads are spinning? <laughs> Mark, did you, did you have something? No, no, no. Okay, um, so if, if none of you guys have any questions, then obviously uh, if they occur to you over the next week, you can bring them to the next class. Um, as is customary, uh, Kel, Andrew, or BD, do you have anything else to add or subtract to what's been said tonight? Nothing for me. Nothing for me either. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, awesome. Good stuff. All right. Nice to see you, folks. Always a pleasure, everyone. Um, I'll have this up as soon as possible. Uh, everybody stay safe and healthy. And uh, yeah, keep an eye open for the return. Um, so just uh, just to give you guys a, a little bit of a taster, um, COVID in Ontario is, of course, I mean, you know, the vaccines are progressing. Um, obviously, everything depends uh, in 2021 on the success of the vaccine rollout and ultimately the success of the vaccine uh, against the different variants that are cropping up. So everything is still up in the air. However, uh, please uh, keep your eye on our Facebook page and keep your ear to the wind about uh, the various different chapters in Ontario potentially restarting in 2021 in the summer sometime. It's possible that this Toronto is it's unlikely Toronto will be the last but it's possible that some of the smaller regions in Ontario will be able to um, get moving on some on some things at least informally in the summer so uh, which is not that far away remember it's not that far away at all so keep your ear to the uh, to the wind and hopefully uh, you know we'll we'll be back out there sooner than we think it's already March can't believe it it's already March so Stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Thanks, Aaron. Thank Thanks, you, Aaron. Thanks, Aaron.